a little bit of making up to do because uh, two weeks ago today in the introduction to standard cost I told you that we made a decision to not cover the two overhead variances the uh, overhead controllable and volume variances and that part of the penalty we paid for doing that was that would have been the point at which I would have introduced you to fixed and variable cost and how they behave. Um, I know it's an overused superlative on my part, this most important thing we do thing, but this ranks right there up, right up there with them. To understand fixed and variable cost and to know that they behave differently and to understand how they behave is one of the tools that managers need, one of the tools that you need in your professional career. So I'm going to have to make amends for that. I want to talk about fixed and variable costs just for a little teeny bit before I start the regular lesson. Now, I didn't expect you to have the handout with you, but I wanted to show you the handout from two weeks ago. This was the Intro to Standard Cost. And to show you, there was a little place in this handout where I was supposed to talk about it. It's this section right here, how costs behave, fixed and variable costs. This is how do they get their names in total, and how do they get their names, and, and how do they behave per unit. And just to give you some correlation for this, I wrote this on the marker board this morning. This was the main thing I wanted to do for this part of the introduction. So, I want you to kind of feel it with me and experience it with me. I want a little feedback from you. What if I told you that in direct materials cost, we spent $20,000 to produce 2,000 units this month? What did we spend per unit? I can't hear you. $10. Ten dollars. Yes? Yes. Now, next month, we produce 4,000 units. How much do you think we're going to spend in total? 40,000. You think so? Yes. You think so? Yes. Did you say 40,000? 40,000. Because it should cost roughly the same. Maybe a dollar, or maybe ten dollars in a nickel, or ten dollars in a penny, or nine dollars and ninety-five cents. But it should be in that ballpark, don't you think? Now, maybe us, maybe a different company. Maybe they spent fifty thousand dollars on labor to produce five thousand units. Would they spend? per hour on light. Well, I, 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 you know, I don't want them all to turn out to be $10, but I want them to be so easy that you'll stay with me here and participate mentally and not tune me out. Okay? <coughs> so, if I produce 2,500 units the next month, how much do you think I'm going to spend in labor? $25,000. Come on. Somebody be with me. Don't you think that'd be 25000 Yes. So, based on these two examples, what can you tell me about direct materials, direct labor? Are direct materials and direct labor, let's take them one at a time. Are direct materials fixed or variable? There's variable fixed. I didn't hear the same consistent answer. Let's try one more time. Are direct materials fixed or variable? Variable. The whole point is that the total change as production change. So if we go to this little chart that we forgot to do or chose not to do in the standard cost thing, variable costs vary in total. That's where they get their name. They're variable. And what about direct labor? Is direct labor a fixed cost or a variable cost? Variable. It's a variable cost. It changed in total as production changed, it changed proportionally to production. When production halved, these costs halved. Yes? So 
Direct labor is a variable cost. That's how it gets its name, is how it behaves in total. But what about this per unit, and this per unit, and this per unit, and this per unit? Do you see what I see? How do variable costs act per unit? <laughs> That's the irony of it all. Variable costs are fixed per unit. Now let's consider property tax. So let's say that I produced 20,000 units, sorry, that I incurred $20,000 in property taxes and produced 20,000 units. How much would property tax be <coughs> per unit? A dollar. Yes? If I produce 40,000 units, what are property taxes? Huh? 50 cents. If I produce no units, how much are direct materials? Zero. Sorry. If I produce no units, how much are direct materials? Zero. Zero. Y'all with me here? If I produce no units, how much is direct labor? Zero. If I produce no units, how much are property taxes? There is some amount. Come on, you can answer that question. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. You're with me here? How do fixed costs behave in total? They are fixed. That's how they get their name. That's why we call them fixed costs. Is that something that you're experiencing back there yourself, or was that related to my talk? Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to ignore you because I'm on a mission here. T tell me about producing one unit. How much did this one unit cost me? $20,000. $20,000 in, in property taxes. So the more I produce, the less it cost me per unit. If I can produce a lot of units, I spread those fixed costs over more units. That's a good thing, don't you agree? Yes. And these differences that we encounter here su should suggest to us that fixed cost per unit vary. vary. That's the irony of it all. If fixed costs are named fixed cost, and variable costs are named variable cost because of the way they behave in total. They're two distinct kinds of costs, and we need to know their differences and how to deal with their differences, and we're going to talk about it for two weeks in a row, this week and next. Let's talk about this week. It's this cost relationship that we're trying to see how we could use as a manager. We've got to know how to do it first before we can make decisions from it. So I think this is reproduced someplace for you in your handout maybe. Um, the topic, the main topic this week is absorption and variable cost. And it's all I'm going to talk about today and probably first discussion. There's a few pages mentioned in the handout, mentioned in the syllabus, mentioned on the screen. I hope they're all the same. If this one on the screen's not the same as the others, it's the one out of date. The one in your hand is the most recent one. A few pages, a very few pages, in this chapter that are, that's really trying to get you to see a, a new way to write the same information on an infant study. We're going to take the same information and write it in a way that managers could use the information better and make decisions from it. 
And so all week long, we keep talking about what a great decision tool this is. Oh, this is a great decision tool. Oh, managers really re want to know this information. Yet, in homework and exercises in class, we don't have exercises given us to work with to make decisions from, to show you what a great decision tool it is. So we picked out just a few pages over in chapter 26, and the book calls this incremental analysis. When I learned it, I, we talked about it being differential analysis. I'll talk about that more when I've got more time later this week. It's a few pages that we're just going to use this particular concept, this fixed variable cost and how they behave thing, to show you what a good decision tool it is under certain circumstances. And the real thing about it is it doesn't matter how you write it down. It doesn't have to look a certain way. What's important is that you make the right decision. And you make the right decision for the right reason. That it be based on sound business principles that we're going to demonstrate to you this week, hopefully. So let's talk about absorption and variable costing. What you're going to hear in the next few minutes is seven characteristics of absorption costing, seven characteristics or explanations of variable costing, and really it comes down to one difference. If you catch on to this very first one, you don't have to worry about the others. Ah, uh, you do, sort of, just a teeny bit. But it's just the same thing six more times to give you another opportunity to understand and give you another opportunity to understand. It's the same thing. Now, in the last three chapters, if I had asked you the elements of cost, what does it take to produce a product? You would have said materials, labor, and overhead. True or false? True. You know that. When you walked in the room today, you knew that to be true. What you saw presented in the three previous chapters was absorption costing. There was no need for us to tell you it was absorption costing because we weren't contrasting it with anything. It was just the way we did it. And you accepted it, and it's still true. So, the first characteristic is a statement that you already know. All costs are absorbed by, become part of the product that we're producing. All costs, meaning the direct materials, the direct labor, and the manufacturing overhead become part of the finished good. So I'm just trying to use the word absorbed to try to get us to understand why somebody named it this. I don't know for sure. But I'm going to pretend that this front row is an assembly line, and we make a product. And I don't know what it is. Use your imagination. But I'm going to say that costs are like a sponge. We're not producing a sponge. Don't misunderstand me. I said they're like a sponge. Do you understand the difference? So I say on that end of the line, it's a dry sponge. And as each person on the assembly line does their thing, uses their technical skill, improves that, gets it closer and closer to a finished product, by the time this thing that we're producing that's like a sponge rolls off the assembly line at the end, it is dripping wet with cost. That it's absorbed. You with me here? Absorption costing. Or you could say they attach to it like barnacles on a ship. That it's just the end, it's just all these little costs. It's property taxes and insurance and direct materials and direct labor and all the other things we've contributed to it. But this transformation occurs as it goes down the assembly line. All the costs become part of the product that we're producing. Contrasted with variable costing that says direct materials, direct labor, and variable manufacturing overhead become part of the product that we're producing. So let's go back, review with me today. What is direct materials? Fixed or variable? Say something. Variable. How about direct labor? Fixed or variable? Variable. How about variable manufacturing overhead? Variable. Duh. Why couldn't you speak up and say that? It's variable. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Have you picked it up yet? What's the difference between absorption and variable <coughs> costing? Have you figured it out yet? Yes. Come on. There's an Come on. Come on. Fixed manufacturing. There's another part of manufacturing overhead that's going to be fixed. There's fixed manufacturing overhead. With fixed manufacturing overhead, it's different. 
everything on the absorption side was variable except fixed manufacturing overhead. And fixed manufacturing overhead wasn't part of the product we were producing on the variable costing side. That's the crux of the issue. So let's talk about how we treat fixed cost, fixed manufacturing overhead. Under the absorption assumption, absorption assumption, fixed and variable manufacturing overhead is included in cost of itself. Right. Included in cost of itself. When we do an income statement from chapter five until this moment, we would start with a good heading, and right after the good heading, we'd subtract cost of goods sold from sales and get something called gross profit. And right after gross profit, we'd subtract all the expenses and get net income, and you're supposed to say, uh-huh, because you remembered how to do that. But on a variable cost <coughs> income statement, only variable cost are part of the product that we're producing. So we're going to start with a good heading and list sales. And from sales, we're going to subtract something called variable cost of goods sold. Now, is it fair to name this subtotal the same as this subtotal when we arrived at this <coughs> subtotal in a different way? No. no. Would that be fair? No. I don't think so. I think that'd be misleading. To call this gross profit would mislead the user of that financial statement to reach the wrong conclusion. So we're going to have to have a new name for that. You only hear it in class. It's manufacturing margin. I've seen it other places, experienced it other places, but I can't find it in this book, and that's okay. We can get along without the term, maybe, but it wouldn't hurt us to know the term. If you do an income statement this week and follow the book's format, and I hope you will, and leave out manufacturing overhead as a subtotal, no big deal. We can get there. What a variable costing income statement does is deduct everything variable. It takes the same information and rearranges it and makes it, hopefully, <coughs> more valuable for management. So not only do we subtract all the variable cost first, we're also going to subtract variable expenses. Now this subtotal is in the book and is important. The revenue we earn minus all the variable costs and expenses we incur is called contribution margin. Contribution margin is the reason we came to class today and we're going to come back again two more times this week. Contribution margin is the most important thing we're going to do this week. If you know what I want you to know this week, by 3.30 Friday afternoon when all the classes have met, you'll be making good decisions, right decisions, correct decisions for the right reason based on your understanding of contribution margin. So work on it all week long. Try to become familiar enough with it that you can attain the success I would like you to have this week. Contribution margin is the excess that's left over after covering all our variable costs and expenses. The excess of revenue over variable costs and expenses. And from that we would expect, we would subtract all the fixed costs to get net income. Now we're contrasting absorption and variable costing. Fixed manufacturing overhead was described as a product cost way back in chapter 19. You heard the terms product cost. That very first introductory, let's get your feet wet kind of assignment on manufacturing used the expressions product cost and period cost. Product cost, the barnacles on the ship thing. The soap sponge when it gets to the end of the line. It becomes part of the good we're producing. Contrasted with variable costing, treating variable cost as a time period cost. They go in this time period regardless. Doesn't matter whether you've sold them or not. If you incurred them this time period, then they belong in this time period. Now here's the deal. When we, under absorption costing, consider fixed manufacturing costs to be part of the product, then this good we're producing has this fixed cost assigned to it, associated with it. If we sell that good this year, we deduct those fixed costs this year, that's not a problem. If we have a product that we've produced and incurred some fixed cost on, and we don't sell it, we carry that good and the cost associated with it to next time period when it will be sold 
and those costs will be deducted. That's the crux of the issue, again, for the fourth time. It's the same old one message I have to convey here, just lots of different ways to say it. If inventory stays the same, absorption and variable costing will give you the same answer. It's when the level of inventory changes that they give us different answers. Period cost, those costs are never associated with inventory. They're always deducted in the time period in which the good is produced. Never carried to another year in inventory cost. Always deducted now. Because of four, five says, when inventory increases, net income will be larger under absorption than it will under variable. I hope you can figure that out on your own before the week's over. Not have to rely on somebody else's words. Let's do it one more time. Here's the product I'm producing here, fixed cost. Variable costing doesn't associate them with the product, but deducts them all now. Absorption costing associates them with the product, doesn't sell the product, carries the product to next time period, and doesn't deduct these fixed costs now like variable did, but next year when they're sold. Variable costing deducted more cost, got smaller net income than absorption when the level of inventory goes. Now, probably the least profound thing I'm going to say today is this. It's the opposite of that. I didn't want to leave that spot blank. I needed something to say there, and this is the best I could come up with. If inventory decreases, net income is larger under variable costing than it is under absorption costing. In one of your homework problems, maybe the very first one you're assigned this week, you have to do two years, one year and then the following year, income statements for absorption costing and for variable costing. So it's this year to year thing that we're trying to get you to see, and we're making predictions or observations about the characteristics that should exist. You watch for them, apply this to your homework, see if it really does come true. Under absorption costing, we can prepare tax returns, we can prepare financial statements that we plan to provide other people. If you're giving information to people outside your organization, you have to use absorption costing. It's the only acceptable way to do it. But if you need to make a decision, certain kinds of decisions, it would be a good thing for you to consider variable costing. You can't do it for tax purposes or accounting purposes, but just internal decision-making purposes, certain kinds of decisions, variable costing is a great way to do it and an analytical tool that could help you make the right decision for the right reason. And finally, what kind of decision is it that you're trying to make? If it's a decision that affects the long run, this mythical, hard to define concept in business, this long run, then you'd be better off with absorption costing because absorption costing is concerned with covering all your costs and that's what we need to do in the long run. To stay in business, we've got to cover all of our cost. It's certain short-term pricing decisions, certain short-term, should I sell this product at this price or not, and some others similar to it, discontinue a product line, keep producing that product line, short-run decisions that are only concerned with variable costs, where fixed costs can't be changed, it'd be better to use variable costing to make that decision. Now, the best thing that could happen today is this income statement, these income statements, plural, that we're going to do. I want you to know many times, I hope I say it at least five times today, that these income statements are for instructional purposes. They line up side by side for a reason. They're intended for you to be curious and to find an explanation of why we did things. When you get ready to do your homework, look to this to understand it, but find an example in the book that's more acceptable to write it down. This is not the way we would really do it. I took some liberties with what you're about to see to try to get the point across. And I'm hoping you'll learn the point, 
understand it better because of the experience that you're about to have. Read the problem with me. Our company began operations in the current year. During the first year, we manufactured 50,000 units. 44,000 units were sold. Can you conclude from what you just heard that beginning inventory is zero? I asked that question this morning. I asked it differently. How much was beginning inventory? And the most common answer I got was 6,000 units. Do you see that it says, without saying in those words, beginning inventory is zero? We just began operations. We produced 50. We sold 44. How much is ending inventory? Say it. 6,000. Now, your mind ought to be jumping ahead. What about the prediction? What about variable absorption costing net income? Are they going to be equal? Are variable absorption costing going to give us exactly the same answer, yes or no? No. When the level of inventory changes, there will be a difference. Which will be larger, do you remember? Variable absorption will be larger. Variable. Variable is going to be smaller because it deducts all the fixed cost. Absorption is going to be larger because it takes the fixed cost to next time period. Absorption costing is going to be the larger answer. Let's read on. Variable manufacturing costs were $12 per unit. Fixed manufacturing overhead was $260,000. Variable selling and administrative expenses were $4.50 per unit sold. Fixed selling and administrative expenses were $150,000. Prepare an absorption costing income statement. Prepare a variable costing income statement. Calculate and explain the difference in the two net income amounts. When you do a variable cost, sorry, when you do an absorption costing income statement, you ought to put a good heading on it. And right after the good heading, you ought to determine the amount of revenue you've earned from selling your product. If you've got calculators with you today, you'd learn more participating. You ought to be active and not passive. You ought to not just take notes, you ought to at least think and mentally engage in the process. If you just want the notes, I could fill it all in and hand it out and we could dismiss class and you could figure it out on your own. Why not learn in class with me today? Do you know how many units we sold? Yes. Say it. 44,000 units were sold at what price? $40 a unit times 44,000 units is how much revenue we've earned? I heard a suggestion of 1.76 million. I was hoping to hear it from more than one person. Auditors? 1.76 million of revenue was earned. Now, have you ever seen us do an income statement where we made such a parenthetical note? Yes or no? Do we usually do this? No. Then why did I do it this time? Because this is for instructional purposes. I wanted you to know. I wanted it to answer your curiosity. I wanted you to want to know how to come up with these numbers from sales. Since chapter 5, we've been subtracting something called cost of goods sold. The formula was beginning inventory. I didn't leave a space for this, and I'll just confess that I've been too lazy to fix it. I could improve this handout and improve this slide right this minute if I included beginning inventory. So why don't you, in little teeny printing, write in beginning inventory. You're going to need it in your homework. In one of your homework problems, there is a beginning inventory, and it's a slight flaw in this illustration. Write in beginning inventory, and tell me the number of the beginning inventory. How much? Zero. We established that a few minutes ago. I'm glad you know that. Begin it, it just seems silly to me to, to write it in zero, but it's not zero in your homework. I needed to address it. You needed to be aware. We'd start with beginning inventory, and to that, we would add those goods that we produced. <laughs> Now, it so happens that we were given the information this time broken down between variable and fixed cost. We don't usually write it down that way, but that's the way we're going to write it down this time. Variable cost were the 50,000 units I produced times the 12, 000, the $12 I spent per unit. Anybody got me that number? $600,000 $600, was incurred. Grant, did I see your hand up? Yeah, did you want beginning inventory under... Cost of goods sold or under sales? I want it under cost of goods sold. It's the first thing in the cost of goods sold calculation. <laughs> it, this cost of goods sold calculation, I want it after that colon on the line between cost of goods sold and variable cost. It would start with beginning inventory, to beginning inventory, I'm going to add this thing I'm still working on. 
Are these all the costs that I incurred in producing the exhibit? Say yes or no. no. What else did I incur? Speak up. Some fixed costs. Some fixed costs totaling how much? $260,000. Could more than one person say that number for me, please? $260,000 of fixed costs were incurred. Have you ever seen us do an income statement where we did fixed and variable costs split out like this, showing our work? No. Why did I do it this time? Because I wanted you to understand it. This is for instructional purposes. This sum is $860,000 of cost incurred. Now here comes the big question. Is it okay to deduct $860,000 from $1.76 million and call the answer gross profit? No. Let me put it to you differently. Is it okay to deduct $50,000 worth of cost from 44,000 units of revenue? If you need to see that in writing, there it is. Is it okay to deduct 50,000 units of cost from 44,000 units of revenue, give me a big hearty answer. Yes or no? No. no. <laughs> I'm setting you up for the most missed question historically on the final. I got tired of it being the most missed question on the final, so I picked the biggest font and the brightest <laughs> color I could to try to get your attention. And for about five years now, I've gotten students to Val's too strong a word, but commit to making this not the most missed question on the final. And you'd think this would do it. And it's still the most missed question on the final. <laughs> so will y'all try? Will you try? Yes. To catch on right now and all week and remember to prepare for the final and get this one right. I'm going to try. And I'm asking you to. Is it okay to deduct 50,000 units of cost from 44,000 units of revenue? No, why not? Because, yeah, that's a literal way of saying that, but I'm thinking of a concept, an accounting concept that that would violate. 50,000 units of cost deducted from 44,000 units of revenue is not matching. matching. Matching is not matching. On the income statement, since we learned about it in chapter one, we've been trying to record all the revenue and all the costs, expenses, the better job we do in matching these with the right time period, the more reliable the result net income is, the more confidence we have that we're telling the truth. We want to match on the income statement. Then what alternative do I have? If I've got 50,000 units of cost and only 44,000 units of revenue, what, uh, what should I do right this minute? Ah. And you would subtract and you Ah. How can I get from 50,000 units of cost down to 44,000 units of cost? I need to subtract 6,000 units in ending inventory. Yes, class? Yes. yes. Well, let's figure out at what price to value the ending inventory. What did we spend per unit to produce these goods? Let's take the 860,000 and divide by the 50,000 units we produced and get a unit cost of... $17.20 has been suggested I could use an audit. $17.20 was incurred. 6,000 units times $17.20 is... $103,200 is ending inventory. If you're with me right this minute, say yes. So... Now, you can work on that literal number. I'm going to need that in a second, but how about giving me an answer parallel to the question I'm asking? What is 6,000 units subtracted from 50,000 units? 50,000 units minus 6,000 units is 44,000 units. What number do you have here? 44,000 units must have cost us $756,800. Yes or no? Yes. Is it okay to deduct 44,000 units of cost from 44,000 units of revenue? Yes or no? Yes. Now that's matching. And when you do, 1.76 sales minus 756,800 cost of goods sold, you get gross profit 
of a million three thousand two hundred dollars and from that we want to subtract the expenses the expenses were presented to us in two categories the variable ones and the fixed ones the variable ones were stated in the paragraph to be four dollars and fifty cents per unit sold forty four thousand dollars forty four thousand units times four dollars and fifty cents is $198,000. The fixed expenses were stated in the paragraph to be $150,000. $150,000 plus $198,000 is total expenses of $348,000. Have you ever seen us do an income statement where the fixed and the variable costs were split apart like this, yes or no? no. Why did I do it this time? So you'd understand it. I wanted you to see where the numbers came from. Gross profit of a million three thousand two hundred minus the expenses of three hundred forty-eight thousand is net income of six hundred fifty-five thousand two hundred dollars under the absorption assumption. We need to remember that number. We're going to compare that number to the result we get in a few minutes. I would love to say do you have questions at this point, but I'm afraid I wouldn't finish if I answered yours. If you've got questions, you ought to jot it out in the margin and ask me right after class or soon. Let's do it again. The instructions say prepare a variable costing income statement. Let's put a good head in. Is it fair for us to glance over at the left side of the page right now and write down numbers on the right side of the page? Is that cheating to look over there and grab that number and write it here? I don't think so. In fact, I, I made a pretty deliberate effort to get those lines to line up so that part of our thinking right this minute would be, what did we do a minute ago, and how does that compare to what we're doing now for instructional purposes? So, sales, look over on the left side. Didn't we get 1.76 million a minute ago? Wouldn't it be the same thing right now? I don't see any difference. Sales. 1.76 million a minute ago was reduced by something called cost of goods sold. <coughs> Is reduced now by something called oh, thank you for that already answer. That was good. Thank you. Variable cost of goods sold. So it starts with beginning inventory. Here's where you ought to squeeze it in. Beginning inventory was now that's Silly to write it in when it's zero, but this is for instructional purposes. So if you use this to try to do your homework, there would be your reminder. There's some beginning inventory and homework sometimes. Variable cost we incurred, 50,000 units produced times $12 a piece, came out to be $600,000 as I recall. Yes? Now glance over the left side at the absorption costing income statement and tell me what we did next. Right this minute we added in the fixed cost. And are we going to add in the fixed cost right this minute? No. Because this is the variable costing income statement. We're just concerned with everything variable. So one way to look at this is that I'm going to demote. I'm going to save until later. I'm going to push them on down the page. I'm going to deal with these fixed manufacturing costs of $260,000 later. You watch. We'll get there. I'm not going to deal with those right now. So, then comes the question. Is it okay to deduct 50,000 units of cost from 44,000 units of revenue in order to say? No. Is it okay to deduct 50,000 units of cost from 44,000 units of revenue? No! Why not? That's not matching. So, how can I get from the cost of 50,000 units down to the cost of 44,000 units? Everybody said subtract out ending inventory. Now we've had some success with this already. How about in the interest of time, we glance over at the absorption costing income statement, we grab that ending inventory figure, and we use it right here. Don't you think that'd be appropriate? Yes. Save a little time. Which we're wasting right this minute. <laughs> Nathan, is there something you want to say? We're not doing the fixed 
We wouldn't do $17.20 for ending inventory over here because that $17.20 includes fixed costs, which we demoted and ignored on purpose. Right, Nathan? We can't value the ending inventory at $17.20. We're going to value ending inventory at $12 per unit. I got behind on my slides. I should have appreciated that last time. 6,000 units at variable cost of $12 each is 72,000 ending inventory this time. 600,000 variable cost of goods manufactured minus the ones you didn't sell means the cost of the ones you did sell, the variable cost of the ones you did sell are $528,000. That's the cost of 44,000 units. Is it okay to deduct the cost of 44,000 units from the revenue earned from selling those 44,000 units? Yes or no? Yes, yes. It is. And if you did, you'd subtract that number. Sales minus variable cost of goods sold is something called manufacturing margin. You'll probably only hear, see it here. $1,232,000 from which we want to subtract variable expenses. Let me encourage you to look over on the left side. Mm -hmm on the absorption costing income statement, way down at the bottom. I'm going to promote, promote, list earlier than we did before, the variable expenses. Can you grab that number for me? Tell me how much. 44,000 times $4.50 each was $198,000, but it's really, 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 really important right this minute that you see where it was listed before and where it's listed now. Earlier. Agree or don't? Mm -hmm. Earlier than before. Yes or no? Yes. Good. Manufacturing margin minus variable selling and administrative expenses is contribution margin. Contribution margin is $1,034,000. Here's the whole point. Don't get so mixed up in the terms and uh, making it look like somebody else's. Relax and understand what we're trying to do. Revenue minus everything variable. Revenue minus everything variable gets you contribution margin, which is the amount left over to help you cover the fixed cost. Let's do fixed cost. Fixed cost that we ignored a little bit ago, 260,000, that we demoted until now. Not only are variable costs listed earlier, fixed costs are listed later. See it, please. Fixed costs two hundred and sixty thousand plus fixed expenses of one hundred and fifty thousand. Total fixed cost and expenses four hundred and ten thousand. We just rearranged the information. Contribution margin minus all the fixed cost and expenses is net income this time of six hundred and twenty-four thousand. That's a different number than we got before. Less. There's another sheet of paper for you to write down what's about to happen, and I'm going to do it pretty fast. Bet you'll be glad. The instructions say calculate and explain the difference in the two net incomes. The difference is the amount we got for absorption costing net income, $655,200. I hope you see it. Don't just write stuff down. See that I got it. The variable number that we got just now, just within the last minute, $624,000. That difference is $31,200. I'm curious. I want to know what caused this difference. We can explain it in two ways. We can get that number again in total or per unit. Let's do it in total. When we did it absorption costing the first time, we valued ending inventory, including the fixed cost, at $103,200. You ought to look on the left side and find that number. When we did it under the variable costing assumption, over on the right side, the income statement said, Net, I'm sorry, uh, ending inventory was $72,000. There's the $31,200. It's in the ending inventory. That's in total. Now, we can do the same thing, but do it on a per unit basis. The first time we valued the inventory at $17.20 per unit, absorption costing. The second time, we only included the variable cost. When we did it under the variable costing assumption, we valued ending inventory at $12 each. 
that's five dollars and twenty cents per unit when you apply that difference to all six thousand units in ending inventory there's the thirty one thousand two hundred dollars again now I'm curious what is the five dollars and twenty cents let me show you that and then we'll quit if you took all the fixed overhead costs you incurred and spread it over all the units you produced. As I recall, fixed manufacturing overhead was $260,000. If you divide that 260,000 by the 50,000 units you produce, you get $5.20. That is fixed cost per unit. Fixed costs per unit were associated with ending inventory under the absorption cost. We're not associated with ending inventory under the variable costing assumption. That is the crux of the issue. It is the treatment of fixed cost that's the difference between variable and absorption cost. It's an important foundation for this week and next. Thank you for your patience. Help me get all the attendance sheets. Have a great day and a great week.